นโมทัสสะปะโกอะโตอรหัตโตสัมมาสัมบุตสะนโมทัสสะปะโกอะโตอรหัตโตสัมมาสัมบุตสะนโมทัสสะปะโกอะโตอรหัตโตสัมมาสัมบุตสะอ่าทุเดย์ดามาทอกนัมเบอร์ทูออฟซีรีส์เอ for all those who are practicing สติปัฏฐานะวิปัสสนา meditation last week we talked about the benefits of The practice, and we discuss in line with how Buddha has stated in the Mahasatipatthana Sutra, <coughs> explaining a little more detail on what purity of minds means. They are still. Some of the things we can mention even before the first benefit that what the Buddha said, the purity of mind. Before we reach the total purity of mind, as we are practicing, there are little things that benefits. Especially those who are interested in this modern-day life. When you practice regularly, and when you have practiced for some time, what you find is your level of intelligence. Okay, especially in seeing. Situations, conditions, problems become sharper and sharper and stronger, and you find that you can solve these problem in a lot quicker and more efficient way. That's one of the little side benefits, I think, small little one side benefits of this practice. But for us in a daily life, that's a big thing, a big deal. And also, one began to find whatever books, literatures, subject you were studying with us is the Dharma. Okay, when you are reading Dharma, Sutra, or any parts of Dharma that you are studying. You find that you begin to understand even more deeper and deeper. The same thing you heard, the same thing you read, the same thing, before you understood a certain level, and then you begin to find you even understand the same thing at a deeper level. That is the benefit. In other words, your level of intelligence, ability to begin to see the. Solutions to problems, deeper meaning, comprehending a lot faster. That kind of benefits one also achieved. These are compared to what the Buddha said. They are very small little benefits, but for some that's a great benefit. And also there's another. This in term of intelligence. And understanding, another thing, health. Okay, health is a a big part of our life, everybody's life. In terms of health, too, when you are practicing and when you are able to reach a certain level of insight, but still, we'll call it a, a lower level. 
Okay, they are, if you want to call in terms of number, they are all 13 different levels of insights. Or in other words, 13 different ways of seeing the nature of mind and matter. When you are in about level four, which is only about less than one third of the level of the whole series. At that time, you began to find Sman. Not everybody, but quite a number of people. They began to find some of the smaller illnesses. You can uh, get rid of it, or cure, or you can overcome it without taking any medication. That's another thing. Especially in big retreat centers, statistically they take it and you found it, statistically it is true. Like some of these small headaches, minor illnesses, cough, cold, or dizziness, these kind of little things, okay, disappear, or even you are suffering from one or the other type of these small illnesses. And then you go and meditate for an hour or two, and suddenly you find that after an hour or two, you're totally gone without taking any pill. Any pains that you have, it's gone. Any kind of heaviness or tiredness or even mentally a bit depressed, they are gone. And some of these practitioners right here might have already experienced some of those things. That is one benefit. And then when you got to the higher level of insight, okay, right around about 11, 12, there are quite a number of recorded history that major illness, serious illness. Not all, but some, like cancer and so on, which the doctors consider incurable or even give a deadline. You have three months or six months or a year. Those people seem to recover, or you can call it remission, suddenly gone. They went to the doctor and checked again, and all traces of cancer cells are gone. These are recorded, and these are also benefits from the practice. And these are, I call it, side benefits, okay, not real major benefits from the Buddhist point of view, small ones. So we talk about these benefits and why, what is the purpose of talking these benefits? And when we practice, okay, of course we are all practicing already and some are starting to come in. And when you come in, there should be a certain surge of desire of wanting to practice with intensity. In other words, motivations are needed. In other words, inspirations are needed. When you have motivation and inspiration, your work excels, your work goes deeper, your works become more intense. For that to happen in a daily language, one needs to know advantages and disadvantages, or benefits and disbenefits, or benefits and pitfalls and dangers. Those are needed for one to get inspired or motivated. Even put it in a colloquial term, you need carrots and sticks. When you have carrots, okay, that's an incentive. You want the carrot, so you try harder. 
You can simply call it through greed. And then stick. Because of the stick there, so you have a fear. Because of the fear, you walk harder or you try harder or you conform harder. Carry it instead. Fear, in other words, is uh, under the word of dosa, loba and dosa. You can call it, in a way, loba and dosa are carrots and sticks. Greed and fear. In other words, there's a desire. You need a desire. And also, some people work harder, harder when they are scared. I said, oh no, this is against the Buddhist principle. Buddhist principle is we are trying to get rid of loba and dosa. So aren't you going against the trend, against the grain? Some people ask. Yes, that is perfectly correct. That question is we are against the grain. But we are trying to reach that state of total purity from loba and dosa. We are on the way. We are on the journey. In there, we still have loba and dosa. So, on the journey, when we are f totally filled with the baggage of loba and dosa, we need to know. And we need to put ourselves apart, the difference between what is in Pali words called visama loba, in other words, wicked desire. And there's another one is called chanda, noble desire. Still desire. There's a wicked desires and there's a noble desire. Wicked desires are self, totally self-oriented interest, without any regards for others. Don't care who get hurt or get harmed. This is what I want. Noble desires are desire. Yeah, that is good for you. You want it good for you, and also because of that, it's also good for others and people around you. So there are two kinds of desire. Wicked desire and noble desire. So while we are still on the journey, we try our best not to bear or carry wicked desire but we choose to go along with the noble desire. So in a stricter sense, of course there's desire, but we have to start. Okay. Small step first before we know how to run a race. Small step. In a small step, we carry on and work together with noble desire. That's why this noble desire in here, we need carrots and stick. One is, when you show the benefits, when you want the benefits, there's a desire. Okay, that is noble desire, because these benefits are good for you, and also when you have it, it's also good and beneficial for people around you. It's beneficial for the society. And also, as we all know, some people work more efficiently and harder under sweet words, and some people work more efficiently and harder under a disciplinary condition, strict, scolding. In fact, one of the yogis who have been with me she was there for about five years in the earlier parts. I talk about it, and one day you say, you know what? 
what? When you talk about these kind of things, uh, what kind of dangers it will come and what kind of fearful things I had, when I hear that I work harder, that's the answer. When you are talking about nice and good and how good to do, how nice to do, it's good, it sounds good, but it doesn't push me fast. Strong enough. So everybody works differently. So, and here we need to do both. Okay. Benefits as well as the danger. The danger will inflict or spread fear of being scared. You. And when you got scared, you will work harder. Harder for that what? For that noble goal again. So today we are going to talk about why we should okay, work hard and what kind of dangers and pitfall we have ahead of us. In other words, let's talk about the stick. In general term, in general term, as we are all here, assume all practicing Buddhists, if you are a practicing Buddhist, you have understanding and belief in karma vipaka, cause and effect. In other words, it means there are many past life before in a stream of existence and there will be many lives after this for existence. If we stay as we always are, if we don't work hard and try to understand the nature of mind and matter. So that's what we understand as a Buddhist. And if we understand and if we accept that, now we need to know what the Buddha said. In the past, we have lived many, many lives, countless lives, you cannot even comprehend it. And those existed, according to the Buddha, okay, our existence are really bad, nasty existence full of suffering existence are uncountable. And little good and favorable existence are just a handful. That's how much we have. That's what the Buddhists have. So in other words, many of our existence are full of suffering and only a few are with suffering and happiness and some are with some happiness. So for that, one need to understand the Buddhist cosmology, which means they are, we have our different realms of existence, different realms of safe existence. Some are in the same planes, some are in the different plane. If they are in the same plane, you can see it, you have a, probabilities are higher to see it. If you are in a different plane, you cannot see, okay, like the way you can see each other. Even here, you can I see each other, but we can't, don't have ability to see every human being on earth. Some we can see, some we don't, only a few we can see, touch, interact, but still in the same plane. So all human beings are born in the same plane. All the animals and birds are in the same plane as us. Okay. Insects that we can see are in the same plane as us. So who are in the same plane we can see and we can interact, interact but who are not in the same plane we cannot see. So they are all together 31 planes of existence. And that 31 plane of existence, the lowest four planes, okay, 
the lowest four planes are full of suffering. Okay. They are called four woeful state and up in English. In Pali, it's called Appaya. Appaya. Appaya means it's a Pali word called Appa plus Aya. Appa means zero, null, void, not negative. Aya means wholesomeness or kusala. Wholesomeness or kusala. Good things to do. So if you add the two things, there's uh, in those existence, there's no chance, no opportunity to do good and wholesome acts. That's called apaya. And that apaya, okay, they are four. They divide into four. One is a hell rum. Hell rum is um, It is on this art, and it is said, it is below ground, below ground. And now we know there's a life exists on the surface, and even deeper on the first few layers, a lot of insects and warm stuff like that. And even deeper in the sea, okay, about quite a few miles down there, they are still there totally different looking. We thought sunlight's necessary, we thought oxygen necessary, but there are creatures in the very deeps a few miles down where the hydrogen sulfides and toxins are coming up. There's nothing but very dangerous kind of chemicals to all the living beings on earth. There are still creatures there. So there's a lot of creatures that can exist far deep below and even far deep ground because they do not bear, some do not bear the same kind of physiology with us. Different face. So that's called hell rum. Hell rum, in a very specific sense, is the those Beings in the hell realms, they have uh, every nanosecond is a constant state of suffering. That's what we mean by hell. And the second one is called Trichana. Trichana is animals realm. Insects that we can see, animals that we can see, and the birds, those are called Trichana. These Trichanas are the same plane as human beings. But they are life too, if you look at it. They are always struggling and searching for food. They are always struggling and searching for mate. Their lives are spent for food or for mating. That's it, nothing other than that. And the third one is called hungry ghost. Hungry ghost ram is very close to human realm, but they are not exactly the same, directly the same as us that we cannot see and touch. But there is a very thin veil and when the conditions are right, we can sort of indirectly interact with these beings, hungry ghosts. Hungry ghosts mean they are always in a constant state of lack constant state of lack. Let's say in general what we know, food, they are always lack, they are always hungry. Shelter, hardly anything. Clothing, they have hardly anything. So we know what is that, food and shelter are the most vital things. For them do the same thing. They are always in a constant state of lack. That's called hungry ghosts. Of course, under the hungry ghost, there are so many different species you can subdivide it into. Okay. 
And then the fourth one is demonic realm. Demonic realms are these are beings, they have a certain power, a certain mental power, but their mental power are only used for one purpose for self interest and for hurting and harming others. That's it. Demons. They are also always in a state of fight. Always in a state of confrontations and fight. They don't have much rest. And whatever they have, it's always on the fighting and confrontation and hurting and harming. Those four states are called apaya. Okay. States where there is totally void of kusala. In other words, they cannot do anything wholesome. That is called apaya. Four realms. And there's another realm, it's called human, human realm. That's where we are. And a human realm is, we all know, but it is defined, it is a mixture. Mixture. There is also suffering and there is also pleasure. Suffering and pleasure exist. Because of the suffering and pleasure exist, as they are always interacting with you, what happens is, based on your reaction, based on your attitude, you always have a choice. You always have a choice. A choice to do bad and a choice to do good. It's always based on the choice. And even that choice is if you don't look after or take care of it, the choices of being doing unwholesome and unwholesome thing always followed by suffering. Suffering are more than to do wholesome and then produce or benefit the happiness. It's less. If you do something you can streamline yourself to do wholesome, which follow with happiness. That's why if you remember the Mangala Sutra, first and foremost, the Buddha said, avoid associating with the fools and always try and associate with the wise. That is where we start dividing the path in the human, which path you are following. Kusala or unkusala, wholesome or unwholesome. In other words, happiness or suffering. We have that. Both are balanced, so we are there. But these apaya, full woeful state, they don't have choice. They are in a constant state of suffering. They are exhausted. They are in pain. They do not have time to think or do about anything good. But we are in a balanced state. We can do both. And there is another Ram called Dewa Ram. Dewa Ram has a, just the Apaya has a four different states. This Dewa Ram has a Six planes. Yes, six planes of the aura. In other words, the lowest plane is the the most inferior time of dewa, and the highest plane is the most superior kind of dewa. Okay, dewa realm. And in those realm, what happened was. To define it, they are always in a constant state of joy and bliss. Always in a state of constant joy and bliss. In other words, they are always partying in our language. If they want a food, they incline their mind. The food is there. If they want something, they incline it. It's there. 
based on the rams, different rams, they have the better, like a one-star hotel, two-star hotel, five-star hotel, just like that. They have a different kind of accessibility. And they are always in the states of pleasure and happiness. You want to go somewhere from here to the moon, they incline their man, instantly they are on the moon. Teleportation. So in other words, it's a constant state of pleasure. So just look at in our own life, okay? When everything is going on great and strong in our life, when everything happens in our life, when we have plenty, we forgot to do meditations or good things or giving. Of course, there's always exception, but in general. But see, as soon as we got into trouble and pain and suffering, stressful, then suddenly, oh, okay, I have to do a little bit. I have to go meditate. I have to go discuss Dharma talk or listen to Dharma talk and so on. You see, that pain and pleasure drive us to do what? When you are in a great state, we forgot. Because so much things to enjoy, we temporarily forgot. The same thing, Dewa, they have constant state of joy and pleasure. They forgot to do kusala. They enjoy whatever the result of the previous great karma and and over there too, they don't have to suffer light ups in a wound and grow and study to learn how to become a dog. It is said in the Dewa Ram, you are instant born. You are born instantly, completely, fully grown, with full intelligence and full facility. That's instant born. A whole life, they don't grow old, they don't age, so they don't see anything old age, sickness and that. They don't see the gray hair. They don't see the broken teeth. They don't have any cough and cold and arthritis. Nothing. The whole life is exactly like that since you were born. And just before they passed away, and Dewa means it's a brilliance. They are beings of light. Brilliance. They always have this brilliance, lights, or you can call it aura, but very aura. And just before they die, that aura little fainted momentarily, and poof, they are gone. When they are die, their corpse doesn't lie around. Just like they are instantly born, they instantly poof, disappear, and die. So in the Dewa Ram, you don't see this old age sickness and death. They don't see the corpse. There's nothing to reflect to get a, a sense of urgency. So that is Dewa Ram. And they live a very, very long life compared to the human. And there's another plane of existence called Brahma Ram. There's about 20 planes of existence. These Brahmas are, okay, they don't even enjoy the senses anymore. They don't need food. Instead of the food, they sustained on PT. They sustain on PT. Okay. Some, as there is, there's no taste, there's no smell. Some even there's no eyes to see. So there's nothing. They live in a state of peace and their lives are very long. Some are longer than the whole universe, born and die, they are still alive. That kind of lifespan they live, and they don't think about doing any kusala or what. They still live in the state of bliss for a long time. Some even began to think they are already in nirvana. There are many stories about encounter with the, those Brahma and the Buddha and some of the Brahma, the Buddhas, give them the Dharma light and they got eventually cessation from 
all form of suffering. So that is 20, they are at 6, 26, human 27, plus four woeful state 31. That is the Buddhist cosmology. And when Buddha said, you have been so many times, so long, your past life, they are all in this four woeful states. We were mostly. And when we come to the human existence, or sometime to the Dewa existence, we could become a Dewa too. That is more like the way it said is, you are there vacationing, visiting, like we walk our whole year hard and we go to the seaside for two weeks vacation, just like that. You are just simply visiting that kind of uh, balance between the human Dewaram existence and Apaya existence. So if you see that, if you understand that, as a Buddhist, I believe what the Buddha said then it is very scary for us to be in this rounds of existence, birth and death and birth and death and birth and death in the sansara. Okay. It's a scary thing. That's a stick. And if you are truly scared of <clears throat> being in this four woeful states for so many uncountable lives and we are just a visitor in this human and they will run, if that scares you, you will really walk hard and practice to escape from the realms of birth and death. Because even in the Dewa realm, you can't practice because so much pleasure. In the Brahman realm, you stay in the state of bliss, but you don't do any more kusala. And hell realm, you have so much with suffering you don't do any kusala. They don't have energy or time. And only when you come into existence as human, you have that opportunity to practice. So if you truly reflect it and if it really touch your hearts, you will be really scared and you would like to escape as soon as possible. And we are talking about human realm. Now, even look in the human realm now. When you look in the human realm, okay, let's go numbers game. We have seven billion peoples. Out of the seven billion people, one billion are Buddhists, let's see. So one in seven has a chance. And out of that one billion Buddhists, I would say even less than one percent are really true practicing Buddhists. I'm not saying Buddhist, practicing Buddhists. Actually practicing according to the Buddhist teaching, upholding, not trying to study the whole Buddhist culture and study and scripture, trying to go to the main point to escape from the all form of suffering. Among the 1%, and even the 1% is less than 0.001% actually practice. So only a handful of people are really practicing to escape from sansara. Okay, among all the Buddhists, 1 billion Buddhists, I would be surprised. if there's half a million Buddhists actually practicing intensely and seriously to escape from all form of suffering. It's a handful of people. That is right now. But even right now, the word right now is scary if we look at it in a larger picture. Because these kind of Buddha's teaching exists only for a short span of time, very short span of time. 
compare in the large scale. And this Buddhist teaching and ability to practice only exists only whenever a Buddha arises in this world. Okay, in this world. When we say world, okay, they call it Kalpa. Okay. This universe born and then die. So in this one cycle of this universe, okay, it is said, only five bitters will be born. And in other words, five human will human being will attain Buddhahood. That's it. And some universe cycle there's zero Buddha. That small amount. And this Buddha Gautama, it said, he is the fourth Buddha of this cycle. And there's one more. And that's it in this whole, right now, according to our science, our universe is about 14 billion years old. Okay. I can go more detail about this universe, maybe one day, but this is not the point we are making. So, and even when this Buddha Gautama born, he's born, and then after he passed away, it said it will only about 5,000 years Buddhist teachings will exist. And we have already gone through 2,600 years, only 2,400 years left. Oh, we think, oh, we have lots, 2,400. But when you look at that with the bigger picture, this is nothing, a drop of rain in the ocean. Now, here we are. Only when there is a Buddhist teaching, through that teaching we can practice and we can escape from sansara. And when there is no more Buddhist teaching, which means in a very technical term, vipassana. Okay. Vipassana will not exist. But all other time, samatha, okay, concentration, meditation, always exist. But vipassana exists only that little short period of time. And during that time, one must bond. Number one, one must bond during that period. Only then you can practice this. And even when you're born, Okay, we are born right now, there's seven billion people. We have all different religions. We have already mentioned about it. They are Buddhists, and even under the Buddhists, people who are actually practicing Vipassanas are just a handful. You can count one, two, three, four. And even among the practitioners, some will actually go through to the end of road. Some will be halfway. So just reflect upon that. It is a very, very rare chance to escape from this sansara. And if you truly understand it, if you really heartfelt embraced it, it is a very scary thing. And we would be rejoicing we are in a great time. Not only we are in a great time, we are right at the doorstep of this practice and we are walking one step into this doorstep. And that should motivate us. That should motivate us. So that is the big stick. Some people will be inspired and wanting to practice based on the benefits we talked last week. And some people may be more motivated if you understand how dangerous, precarious our lives are, hanging in a balance of this little period that we are so fortunate, and also gathering here together where we have the Buddhist teaching and the practice we are doing. Reflect it deeply, go home, 
before bed, put your hands on your head and think. Think to the point that you can really feel in your heart. And I hope that it motivates you. I hope that it inspire you. So may all of you be able to understand the benefits and danger of practicing or not practicing vipassana. Ours is satipatthana vipassana, pure vipassana. And then God inspire or motivate it and be able to practice with all vigor and may you attain Nibbana, the end of all form of suffering, as soon as possible. Sadhu, 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 buddham ujjami. Dhammam ujjami.